So we're going to talk about why the independent sample T works the way it does. And what I'm talking about with an independent sample T is that I'm going to be looking at two samples that are independent from each other and we want to see the difference between them. So for example, maybe I sample a group of people and I give them my elixir and I want to see if it makes them smarter. Well, I might want to compare that to a separate group of people who I give a placebo drug to. So that's two samples now of those who got my placebo and those who got my elixir. And I want to compare them to see if the elixir made the group who got it um, go higher in their IQ. That's different than a dependent sample T where I take the same people and give them both a placebo and uh, an elixir. So this is going to be two independent groups. Um, and the math is going to be a little different. This one can be a harder concept to understand. So I want to take my time and make sure that I orient you. And the first thing I can do is kind of go back to what we learned about a one sample T so that we feel comfortable with the material. So remember, I'll just get myself in here. Oops. Remember when we were looking at um, the one sample T, we had this distribution and we ended up creating a distribution of uh, means so that we had the proper comparisons. When we ended up taking a sample, we could no longer just compare the sample to raw scores. We had to create the distribution of means. So when we looked at this formula, we went from x bar minus mu, but then we had to divide by the standard deviation divided by the square root of n. I just want to remind you what we did there. Um, we could no longer just divide by the standard deviation. We should have been dividing by the standard deviation for the distribution of means. Well, we realized that we can simply create the standard deviation for the distribution of means divide it by dividing it by the square root of n. So this denominator here is the standard deviation for the distribution of means, otherwise known as standard error. Now that's review. And I just wanted to orient you to remind you why we did this so that I can orient you to our next equation. Um, so if that needs to be recapped, go back and look at the video about why we ended up using the standard deviation for the distribution of means here and not just standard deviation. But essentially what we had to do when we started taking a sample is we had to change our formula to accommodate the sample. The standard deviation in the denominator always has to be the standard deviation for the distribution we're looking at here. So now let's say that we're interested in two different, sorry, two distributions. So if we have two distributions, we've pretty much um, kind of doubled our efforts here, right? And so what we wanna look at is how the mean of one distribution is compared to the mean of another distribution. And that's going to subtly change our equation. And I want to walk you through all the, actually not subtly, it's going to massively change our equation. And I want to walk you through all the little changes so that you can understand why it works. Now, I do want to pause and say that many of my students just say, okay, I trust you that it works and I know how to plug in. But I like for students to understand where it comes from. So that's why I'm kind of walking you through it so slowly. So let's look at this, oops, no, this equation. And I'm going to just put it over here. So this is actually the same equation up here, just written in the form of the distribution of means. So hopefully you remember that this stands for the standard deviation for the distribution of means. All I did was replace this denominator with the symbol that stands for the standard error of the mean. And the reason I wanted to do this is because it can kind of help us orient what to do when we want to build the formula when we're comparing two different distributions to each other. So if we look at this distribution, or sorry, this equation, let's talk about how it's going to change now that I have two distributions and not one. So this is our new equation, and you can see how things have kind of doubled up. So now I have two x bars. Here's the x bar for the placebo group, and here's the x bar for the elixir group. And now I have two mu's. There's going to be a mu for the placebo group and a mu for the elixir group. And then we have this in the denominator. So I'm first going to talk about the numerator and then I'll talk about the denominator. But I hope you remember when I talked about um, all of these equations in the past, the mean is never the problem. The mean is the mean is the mean. It's always that darn standard deviation that makes, that throws in a wrench to our equations. And so while this symbol here looks pretty simple, 
it ends up getting a little complicated. So I want to walk you through slowly. But let's first talk about the numerator. So when we're talking about this numerator, we can see how we have, um, we're following the same model, x bar minus what we thought we'd get from the population. Well, now we're looking at a distribution of differences. We have to create the distribution of differences. So we have this distribution minus this distribution. And remember, when we do math to one side, we have to do math to the other. We have to compare apples to oranges, just like we had to create a sampling distribution of means. And now I have to create a sampling distribution, a sampling distribution of the difference between means. So I have to calculate a difference between these and create a distribution of differences. That's why this looks like this. It's the standard deviation for the sampling distribution of differences between means. Well, the numerator would be what is the difference between the means minus what we thought we'd get in the population. Now let's pause for a second and think about what that would mean. I just want to write on this. What is the null hypothesis? The null hypothesis is no difference. Remember, we always assume the null to be true. We're not going to assume that there's a difference between the elixir and the placebo group until we've been proven otherwise. We're going to assume the two groups are exactly the same. So if we assume them to be true, sorry, if we assume them to be the same, then that means this really should go to zero because the mu of one, the population hypothesized mean of one should be the, the hypothesized population mean of the other. So the same number subtracted from each other would be zero, which means the numerator actually gets simple. It's just the two x bars minus each other because this is gonna go to zero theoretically. So that leaves us with this beast in the denominator. And again, our, our goal is to create a distribution of differences. And fortunately, we already know how to accommodate sampling distributions. We just simply divide by the square root of n. But now I want to talk about how we create the standard deviation for the dif distribution of differences. Um, I'm going to color coordinate this if I can. Let's see. Um, Oh. Let's say for the placebo group, we had a sample size of 100 and a standard deviation of three. And let's say for the placebo, uh, for the elixir group, we had a sample size of 10,000 and a standard deviation of two. Now, when I'm trying to decide what to do with this denominator, I have to decide whether to use the three or the two in my denominator, right? And remember, we're trying to create the standard deviation for the different of the distribution of differences, but I think the way uh, I'm gonna put this together, it might make more sense. So should I use the three or the two in deciding um, what to put in my denominator? So hopefully you're thinking um, both, or maybe you're thinking the two. So I think the two probably feels a little bit more valid in um, trying to guess the distribution, um, the population standard deviation, because it has 10,000 people in it versus the other sample has only 100. But I would also like you to take away that both distributions are good at guessing the um, population rate, and I shouldn't just throw one away. However, you can see how the 10,000 people uh, is a better estimator than the 100 people. So while I want to include both because they're both valid, um, I want to value the 10,000 people more than um, the sample that only has 100 people. So what I want to do is find a number that can take both those numbers into account. So do we have a number that we can use to represent the three and the two? So hopefully you're thinking of the average. So I can average the three and the two, right? I could do three plus two divided by two. But that average doesn't really do much for me in weighting the standard deviation of two more because it has 10,000 people. So I do wanna average this two standard deviations um, so that I can have a better estimate of the population rate, but I wanna weight the one higher that has more people in it because you could see how having more people does a better job at guessing the population rate. And so instead of just straight up averaging, I'm gonna weight them. I'm gonna weight them by how large the sample size is. And the way I can weight them is to multiply it times its sample size. So you see how if I multiply three times 100, 
and then I multiply two times 10,000, and then I divide by 10,100, what I've done is I've given the, the two kind of more weight. It's almost like the sample sizes that had, there were 100 samples that had a standard deviation of three, and 10,000 samples that had a standard deviation of two. And so when I average them all together, three, 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 plus two, 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 10,000 times, I will get a number that is a better estimator of the population rate because there's gonna be more representations of the two than there were of the three. So this weighted averaging, rather than calling it an average, we call it a pooled variance. So we call this um, SP for pooled. Now remember, I'm gonna leave things in variance form um, and I alluded to this early in my class that when we're starting to do these kinds of calculations, we want to leave it in variance form until we're all done. Once we're all done, we'll square root the whole thing. So when we look at this equation, it's, it put them back into variance form and it weighted them by the sample size. So here's the variance of the placebo group times the sample size and here's the variance of the elixir group times the sample size. You know, it's a little different. It's sample size minus one. When we're doing these equations, we actually deal with degrees of freedom, but conceptually it's the same thing. I'm taking the larger sample size and weighting it more than the smaller sample size. And then to do a, um, an average, I have to divide by the number that I'm looking at, and this is to help account for the fact that I've multiplied them up here. So this is gonna be called our pooled variance. Now I wanna point out that this symbol doesn't look like that symbol. I'm not done yet. This is a, another way in which the independent T calculations can be complicated. But fortunately, once we teach you how to do it, a JASP will do all the work for you. So a goal, our goal was to do the numerator, which is X bar minus X bar, divided by the standard deviation for the distribution of mean differences. This is just our pooled variance. But to make it a distribution of means, I have to divide by the square root of N. I haven't done that yet. This was just to do an averaging. I still haven't divided by the square root of n. Even though there's n's in there, this is part of averaging. This isn't part of making a distribution of means. So to create this standard deviation um, of the sampling, I had to divide by the square root of n, which means I need to take this pooled variance and divide it by the square root of n. So when we put this over here, our goal was to find this standard deviation for the sampling distribution of mean differences, we're going to take the pooled variance and we have to have them count twice because we have two means. So we have this pooled variance divided by the original sample size and this pooled variance divided by the other group sample size. So this, these pieces are all the pieces that go into calculating the independent t-test. The way we interpret it is exactly the same as a one sample t. It just took a bit more work to get to this uh, equation. If you can conceptually understand what we've done, then it's important for you to know that JASP will do the calculations, but you can relate it back to the t distribution. One last point I wanted to make before we move on. This distribution here, uh, the, sorry, this pooled variance here, I want you to think about what it should be. If I'm trying to take this number of three and this number two and I'm pooling them by weighting them, can the average between these two be outside the range? Could I have a pool variance of one or let's say of five? Hopefully you're thinking no. If you're averaging two and three, the number has to come between two and three, right? And so the pooled variance is always going to be between these two numbers. It's never going to be outside those two numbers. And now if you're trying to make a best guess about the pooled variance, and you know it's going to be between two and three, in this case, two, the standard deviation of two has 10,000 people in it, and the standard deviation of three has 100 people in it. If we're going to lean towards three or two, which way are we going to lean in our pooled variance? Is it going to be closer to three or is it going to be closer to two? And actually the number is going to actually be closer to two because we have 10,000 representations of that two. And so that means we're, our numbers are going to be leaning towards the two. So even though it's going to be between two and three, it'll be closer to two 
than it will be to three, which makes for great test questions. Okay, in our next video, we're going to do all the six steps to see how you would actually get um, your calculated T and um, decide whether you're rejecting the null or not.